And first up, we have Rod Humble, whom, um, if you read the program, you know that he was recently appointed CEO of Linden Labs, which is one of, uh, it seems like a really interesting place to work. He also led the EA Play label for many years. Um, I think uh, I hardly need to point out that The Sims was the most profitable division at EA. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but also not mentioned in the program is the fact that Rod is also an indie game developer. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I encourage you, he has three games online that you can check out. I encourage you to play through these. They're pretty um, different, <laughs> I'd say. And I'm really looking forward to hearing him talk a little bit about that process. And I think he's going to show a couple games that aren't live yet. Um, he also shared with me that this is the most nervous he's ever been giving a talk. <laughs> um, and it's mostly because Chris Crawford is in the audience. <laughs> but also because he says there's so many people here um, who uh, he's you know collaborated with and has respect for. So, um, so don't be too mean to him, please. <laughs> Anyways, it is my great pleasure to welcome Rod Humble. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Um, today I'd like to talk to you about the future of games, and more specifically, a series of problems that may be addressed over the next century. This is a lucky time that we live in. There's one fairly benevolent superpower in the world. Um, trade now uh, extends globally, and in each of our cities we can get goods from all over the world. Communication has been enabled like never before. And game designers are at last rising in stature. Uh, perhaps on a more serious note, the most recent European war happened decades ago. And it was won by the side which invested most heavily in war games. Is it, is it any accident that since the Franco-Prussian War 40 years ago, that there has not been a single major conflict across the European continent. <laughs> and I say to you, as we sit here in the year 1911, that we have the very real prospect that the 20th century may be the most peaceful and uh, <coughs> the most peaceful and prosperous century in the in the history of humanity. <laughs> and perhaps in small part that can be by the power of games and war games, because. If, as the Franco-Prussian War has showed us, that you can predict the outcome of a war ahead of time, what better deterrent could there possibly be? One merely has to have the generals go and play a game, and there's no need to have the war. Or you can just come and show the results. And millions and millions of lives are saved. And so I say to you that the future of gaming is bright and wonderful. So, back in 2011, um, and here today, um, I recognize that's a little bit of uh, silliness, but I, I wanted to look back a hundred years ago um, and think the kind of things I might have said then, because I am an idiot. Um, <laughs> and that actually seemed pretty logical, because I, I, I love war games, and um, it's, it seemed like a fairly logical progression to make. Um, the Part of the reason for the structure of the talk, it's going to be quite odd, um, and the reason for that is Michael asked me to to do this talk. I think it was a couple of months, a few months ago. Um, and since then, um, I've come to realize that this is the the time when I'm least certain about the future of games that I've ever been in my entire life. Um, the The way that our our art form is is spreading across the world really, I find it very hard to keep track track uh, track of. The other reason, as was mentioned, I'm particularly nervous is uh, just about everybody I respect in the industry is in the room. Um, and so this is going to be, I'm going to refer to notes a lot. Um, what you don't know is the notes just say, make stuff up, make stuff up, make stuff up <laughs> on each page. They actually say that. Which probably is more scary, isn't it? It's sort of robotic. But um, so, so what I want to give you is a series of problems that I think are that we're going to be hitting in the century to come. And then just take a look back at the problems that might have emerged on a similar vein in 1911. So the first one was uh, this outrageous claim that games could actually change the world. 
um, the, the idea that well, war games could somehow be predictive. Um, and there's our wonderful world back in 1911, how things have changed. But it really was a global, uh, globalizing time. The communications really were revolutionizing the world. And game designers really were on the rise. Uh, H.G. Wells just published uh, Floor Games in 1911. Um, one of the most famous people in the world had become a game designer. It was a big deal. Um, interestingly enough, um, the, uh, his games were creativity tools. Um, yeah, Little Wars that followed afterwards was very much a make, make your own kind of game out of toy soldiers. Uh, it's still fun today, by the way. It's a physical game that you get, that you get, to, uh, that you get to play with. Um, and so, why do I have these problems at all? Are there, are there any kinds of uh, larger themes that might emerge? Um, so, as we sit here in 20, 2011, I have to say, a lot of things that I had hoped would happen have happened. And I think we've made it to the promised land. Um, and the main thesis of my talk today will be, let's go back to the desert, um, because it was much better there. So in 1911, um, uh, it's a pretty, pretty pessimistic talk. Um, in 1911, the question was, can, can, can games change the world? Um, and the question today is, what do they do if they can? Because um, I think they can. I think they are. So my little straw man example actually wasn't that silly. Um, games have started a war. Um, in 1969, uh, the soccer war, or the football war, broke out between Honduras and El Salvador. Uh, this was a football match, a World Cup qualifier, and actually sparked a war. Tensions were already high, but boy, the passion of that game certainly put it over the top. Um, as, the, uh, as the final whistle blew and the results came out of the radio, actually a uh, little girl shot herself through the heart. Um, that's how important it was, uh, that particular game, uh, to those people. Thousands of people died. On the other hand, did games ever stop a war? Yeah, that's a little harder to see, um, but game theory certainly uh, did have a large influence on the Cold War. Uh, there was this brinksmanship of uh, who's going to shoot their nukes at each other first. Uh, Thomas Schelling received the Nobel Prize in 2005, I believe he's still alive. Um, and I can tell you that as, uh, as an adolescent and as a child growing up in that world of brinksmanship and the Cold War had a massive impact on me. Um, we had a poll, um, maybe some of you of my, of my age, um, maybe this is a European thing, but we had a poll when I was in school and it asked students, how likely do you believe there is going to be a nuclear war within your lifetime? Uh, and 75% said yes, I was one of them. So the impact of all of these kids believing that you know, Armageddon is going to uh, happen before they're growing up, so I, think, I think it's a pretty big psychological blow um, that impacted my generation. Um, it was also quite odd when, you know, the Cold War ended and you know, when you're told the world's going to end and it doesn't, it's sort of a, in a way, it's, it's a bit of a letdown. Um, <laughs> but, in, but, in, but in other ways, you know, well, well, now what do we do with our lives? Um, uh, I decided to go and make games. Um, I would say one thing about game theorists, which is, it's, it's very odd, they tend not to hang out with commercial game designers. Uh, there's this snooty, look-down view that game theorists have um, and it's funny because we have the same snooty look down view of people who are in the gambling industry. Like, like somehow they're different from us. Um, oh, it's gambling. They're completely different, horrible people. Nothing to do with us. And the game theorists have the same view of commercial game designers. We're serious people analyzing human behavior. The game theory thing is just a word. You don't worry about that. And it's pipe. It's Dean, please pass the wine. Um, but actually, they're, they're extremely useful tools. And I would encourage any of you. Uh, within the room um, who are interested in uh, broadening your knowledge of game design um, to really um, uh, get game theory uh, books, uh, economic or uh, conflict studies. It's a fascinating, fascinating uh, story. Um, so the other thing that happened, there was one very unusual development over the past hundred years, is games became an art form. And if I'd been standing here a decade ago, maybe a bit longer, um, I would have been telling you, I want games to be an art form. Um, and that was an amazing victory. And I think many of the people in this room um, took part in it. Uh, but now it's, it's recognized. There's an art gallery um, over, the, uh, over the bridge that's displaying uh, art games right now. I know because mine's in it. I mean, the, there are audiences who appreciate games as high art. 
Thousands and thousands of people have said that they like certain games as high art. Game creators have said they've made it as high art. And game critics treat them as high art. Uh, this is this month's art news, by the way, that Ian's in. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a yeah, so what. Um, again, a little bit of a disappointment. I, uh, I, I, I thought this was going to be the struggle of our lives. And there was kind of like we all showed up with banners outside the, uh, the academy. Let us in. They just politely opened the door and said, well, of course, there's your place. <laughs> Next to music and dance. <laughs> now, sh pray, show us your work, sir. Show us your work. Um, so, so that was really nice. Um, I, I don't want to diminish our victory uh, there, but a lot of it, as John Sharp pointed out and other more knowledgeable people, is I think a lot of it was just us game designers really didn't have much of an understanding of what art criticism was anymore. So when we show up and we say, hey, look, we've, we've made um, art out of our games, people were like, yeah, well, Andy Goldsworth has made art out of leaves, and, you know, what's your, <laughs> what would your, what's your problem? And I think that the debate now has changed uh, to artists and the works they create rather than art forms. But I don't want to diminish our victory. Um, it was, it was a, uh, a long, hard fight, and uh, for me, um, my journey started with uh, Chris Crawford's Dragon Speech um, over 15 years ago, where I, I was a commercial game designer and sat in the audience, and Gordon Walton uh, took me to GDC. And uh, he, so I'm going around, he introduces me to Chris Crawford, who uh, had made Eastern Front that I played. He introduced me to Sid Meier. I think he may have introduced me to uh, Will Wright, but I don't remember. He certainly introduced me to uh, Dan Bunton, or Danny Bunton later. And I thought, wow, this is a great industry. Like, everybody's really friendly. What I didn't know, of course, is that Gordon knew everybody and was actually just introducing this punk ass kid. I just thought everybody got to do that. Um, but one of the things that happened in, in Chris's speech is I, I saw one of the most famous game designers in the world tell me that I wasn't good enough. And by the way, the whole industry wasn't good enough, and he was leaving. Um, and it changed my whole outlook. I feel like, yeah, maybe we can do something with this medium. Maybe we can change things. Um, so thank you for that, Chris. And if anybody actually wants to look at a good talk rather than this one, uh, you may want to uh, Google the, the Dragon speech. Um, it's inspiring now as it was then. Um, so the question that, that occurs now in the 21st century, now we're in art form, now that there's no disputing it unless there are some critics out there who would be, well, oh, you're still in art form. Yeah. To, to be honest, they're now in the time machine business, which is they'd have to invent a time machine to go back and destroy all these works and remove the memories of all the thousands of people who've enjoyed them and remove brains of people who've created them. So I, I'm going to put that aside for a moment. But there's a larger question is, does art actually change people? Does it actually have an impact? Because if we're going to be this massive art form, and we already are, by the way, it's it's frightening in many, many ways, then we've got to start thinking about what we're doing. Um, so, you know, a child looking at a painting, all right, okay, I, 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 I think that, that that may change them in some way. Um, the, the, the main problem is, is that we're afraid of our critics. Um, there are, I'll back up a slide first, uh, there are many critics out there who, who we believe mean us harm. Um, who are like yes, you influence people, and it's and it's and it's for and it's for bad purposes. Um, I'm going to uh, address that in one moment, but let me let me give you a a personal anecdote of how we can actually change people's lives with art. And the only reason I'm I'm bringing up a personal experience is because I know everything from start to finish. So when I um, when I released the marriage, it was a game that I'd made as art deliberately, and I received these wonderful emails from people. Um, men and women, and the men ones were like, hey, you know, th this, uh, this helped uh, help me show uh, my wife how our marriage is. And then uh, some of the women, like, I understand my husband a lot better now, thank you very much, and one husband was particularly nice, which is, I went home and I, I bought my wife flowers because I, because I played your game. Um, and my wife had a very different response, by the way, to <laughs> any of this sort of stuff. Um, Hers was she played it and we're like, was well, this some kind of power game? You're like, it's all about you. You're a, a completely selfish freak. Um, <laughs> and uh, so some of the uh, uh, ladies, some of the ladies in the audience who are game designers have also been kind enough to tell me that my game is uh, very, very actually male uh, from a male perspective. 
um, all I can say is I apologize. It was deliberately done as a personal expression. Um, but I, I started to worry about that feedback because for all the people who email you nice things, well, what about the ones who didn't email me? What if there were people out there who are like, yeah, I played this and I kind of think my husband's like you and he's a bit of a dick. Um, or I played this and you know what? I really, I, I think I need to push my wife around a little bit more because that's, um, <laughs> that seems to be the right way. And I, I, I'm half joking, but I don't really want that kind of power. Um, particularly if it's, if it's even worse, like the husband is, wow, I played your game, I want to buy my wife flowers, and then the wife, the same, the wife in the same relationship writes me and said, yeah, your game convinced me I need to divorce my husband. Um, all of a sudden, what, have I broken up a marriage? Is that kind of work of art do that? It could have certainly have broken up mine, but it didn't. Um, but I do think that art has a certain power, and games have a very, very strong amount of power um, that I think is unique. Um, and that's, that's going to be something that I would invite you to shoot down later. Um, by the way, the, uh, part of the way, one of the other crises that I've undergone over the past six months, and I actually believe Michael invited me because he knew I was going through these series of crises, because he thought it would be incredibly amusing, is not, not only have I changed my philosophy uh, of games, but I've also become very, very distrustful of PowerPoint and the way that it, it guides my thoughts. It, it's sort of inhuman. Um, so I'm using PowerPoint. Um, I also have become extremely distrustful of one-way dialogue. Um, you know, if it was good enough for Socrates, it, it's good enough for me. And you know, Socrates didn't write things down not because he was stupid, but because he fundamentally distrusted any kind of argument or a proposition that couldn't be pushed and pulled back and forth with. Um, and I share that belief. And if there's one ray of hope, and this is the only ray of hope I'm going to give you today, um, is that games can do that. Like any argument we put forward inherently is going to be uh, interactive. You will be able to push it back and forth. So it's not going to be entirely won by propaganda. Um, of course, it can be a rigged game. Um, you know, you'll always pick the same choices, but I'm hoping that over time, those structures will emerge to more educated uh, players. So that's the one ray of hope, is I do think our form is almost uh, Socratic in the way it is. Uh, but I would invite anybody during my talk, if you do have any questions or you just want to say something, please raise your hand. Um, I far prefer that kind of interaction to a one-way uh, talk. And uh, as I said, I've become angst-ridden about giving talks anyway. But I'm aware of the fact that I've never gone too far about it, and now we're getting really meta that you guys know I know, and... Well, no. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we're back to our... Back to our critics. So, so we have critics around the world. Um, a few years ago, in 2007, the Pope um, issued a uh, extremely mild... And I'm not Catholic, and I'm not religious, but it was an extremely mild plea to people who make video games saying, hey, I understand you need to make entertainment. Does it have to be meaningless violence? Does it have to be meaningless sexual innuendo? Could you not raise your game a little bit? I'm paraphrasing. The Pope doesn't say, could you not raise your game a little bit? Uh, actually, what he, what, what, he, what he ended with was, um, you know, I appeal to the leaders of the media industry to educate and encourage producers to safeguard the common good to uphold the truth, to protect individual human dignity, and respect, promote respect for the needs of the family. That's really not an asshole thing to say. I mean, it's, it's actually okay. That's, that's a reasonable argument and a reasonable request to make. Even if we can say, oh, but the Catholic Church, look at them, oh, they're trying to lecture us, they look, look at their house. Well, let's, let, let's take on their criticism for a moment here. Um, the next thing is, one thing that scares our, our real critics out there, and the ones that I think we should engage, is the amount of time and the engagement level that games can bring. Um, the power of our medium is really frightening to a lot of people. Um, many of you will have um, significant others who might tell you about your game face, uh, or they might tell you, uh, by the way, you've just spent four hours playing a game. Um, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever heard that. Or, by the way, it's 3 a.m., you've got to be up at work in the morning and you're playing this game. And us as game designers, we're like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> got them. They're loving it. They're having a great time. <laughs> Not so sure. Not so sure. Um, so uh, here's, here's one of my favorite, um, my favorite poems. It's, uh, this is a bit of a 
longer poem that has a great deal of meaning uh, for me. But let me read you just one segment. Um, the land's sharp features seem to be the century's corpse outlet, his crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of German birth was shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. I love this poem. This poem makes me cry. It makes my heart sing. If you caught me reading this poem, you'd say, you know what? What's a pretty educated guy. He's pretty cool, you know? Look at the poem. <laughs> he's, he's really into this. If I read it for 500 hours, you guys would think I was out of my mind. When you design an MMO, and I've designed a few, 500 hours is the target goal. You say, we need 500 hours of gameplay because it's a subscription business and we want our users to get value for money. And they're going to be paying us 15 bucks a month. 500 hours. 500 hours! And many of you in this room are looking at me like, 500 hours, that's not a lot. Dude, I, I do time, I, I've done time in MMO. I've played games for way more than 500 hours. Lightweight. You're, so have I, by the way. Your 500 hours is just, this is the lower end. And yet we're sitting in there repeating the same mechanics again and again and again with the game phase of, well, what's going on? I think there's an enormous amount of power there. And it frightens me in the same way I think it frightens many of our critics. When the Chinese government puts in place limits of people's time playing online games, really can you blame them? I mean, I, again, many criticisms of the Chinese government, but really, is it that unreasonable to say, these people are playing four hours a day, every day. What the hell's going on? We need a little bit of control on, on this. This medium is frightening and incredibly powerful. When the Australian government comes down and puts in some ratings, and I know, you know all of us in the, in the industry don't like to acknowledge this, and say, hey, this kind of game, we're really worried. We, we don't want it in our country. Our general response is to mock them. Um, well, they treat our medium more seriously than we do. And quite often I think that we game makers have this clown nose on, clown nose off kind of act of, you know, when, when people are writing legislation, and have you noticed, by the way, that just about every parliament and democratic country around the world has introduced some kind of legislation against our media uh, to try and regulate it because they recognize its power. When they do that, we put our clown nose on and we say, ah, these are just games, line up, what's wrong with you? And then the moment their backs are turned, we take the clown those off and say, we're art, you should take us seriously. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think we can do both at the same time, and we can dispense with the clown nose and say, yes, we can make utter crap, but yes, we can also make meaningful, deep experiences. And we're going to take some responsibility for it. Um, similar manner with um, one of my favorite paintings, Eternal. Artwork has a limit in terms of how much time you should put into it. And I, I understand the arguments of, oh, you don't understand an MMO. It's got a whole bunch of uh, content in it. You're actually, it's like reading hundreds and hundreds of books. I get that. I really do. But I'm also a structuralist and a proceduralist. I'm, I'm, I'm with the bad micrometosis of this world. I believe, that, I, I believe that the structure of a game has a meaning. And I believe that the structure of the game has a message that gets through, it seeps into the player's uh, conscious and subconscious, and I think that message it, um, gets delivered. Whether it changes human behavior or not, I think it does. Uh, I'm just going to write out and say, and say, I think games can change humans, human, human, human's behavior. And I'll give you, two, I'll give you two contrary examples. On, on one hand, um, I have played Dungeons and Dragons all of my life. I've played. Uh, shooting games all my life, I've played war games my entire life, and yet I'm not a violent person. Ask anybody who knows me. I'm a really nice guy. So clearly games have not influenced my behavior. And yet, I've also played games that have changed my entire outlook of the world. I've played games that have entirely changed how I actually will live my life. So when you have these two different things balancing out, then I think it's extremely important to look at it and say, okay, how, how can we take responsibility as game, as game creators? I don't know whether we should have a Socratic oath, like doctors, uh, but something. 
And this, this, is, this is my first problem that I'd like to set for you today. By the way, I don't have any answers today. I just have problems. Um, so in case you guys are wondering, I'm like, I can't wait to get to the punchline. This is going to be great. I don't have any answers at all. Um, I'm extremely worried about these problems. So what game should we ethically build? Um, so I'm, let me, uh, I'll do demo time because me sitting here, up here full of angst is going to get old really quick. Um, let me show you a couple of uh, things. So the one thing I think that, you guys can look at my desktop. Uh, the, one of the things I think that games can do is if we ask ourselves what kind of art can we make that we know is not going to be harmful, that will cause no harm. And I, I think that we have to be really careful about putting messages in our games because if they can affect people, and if you have a hundred odd million people playing your game, and by the way, there are games out there now that do have a hundred odd million people playing it, then if you're going to be influencing some of those, you've got an enormous weight on your shoulders, particularly from a, a structural perspective. Um, and I think that we should follow the tack of art forms before us. And to me, the, the most noble and the hardest art to make is one, is one that celebrates and reflects nature, including human nature. Um, and I think that if you look at it from that perspective, what are, what are natural areas for games to be able to address? And I think that they are issues of power, class, and freedom. Because games and game structures, all games or software toys are going to have, uh, computer games and computer software toys are going to have rules. And even if you want to make the most free, open-ended exploration game possible, there are going to be rules there set in place by the game designer, and that's your opportunity. And I think those rules are very good at expressing power. So uh, let me talk to you about, um, there are two games I'm going to show you, and actually some of you have, uh, have asked me before, why, why, why haven't I released any new games recently? It's not because I was changing jobs or any, or any contractual issues, actually. Both Electronic Arts and uh, Linden Lab have been very, very supportive of, of releasing these games. Actually, I, I, I had a, a real crisis developing um, Perfect Distance, which is a game about a man who is in a war and comes to believe that um, he doesn't have any free will. It has a happy ending, don't worry. Um, and, and as I was going through that crisis, I, I, I started to realize that some of the issues I, would, I, was, I, I was addressing, I I thought were too serious to have a wide audience. Um, I, I really didn't want, frankly, I didn't want it out there. Um, I'm going to show them to you today because now I've kind of changed my mind a little bit. Um, but I think the, the last game that I actually released was Last Thoughts of the Auroch, and that was on a similar vein, and I think many people thought I lost my mind. It was about the last thoughts of the last of a species of Auroch, and it was almost non-interactive of lines going on a squiggle screen. Um, but that was that led me to a whole bunch of thinking about free will. Anyway, I kind of lost the plot there. Let me show you this. So this is uh, a game uh, sexually entitled uh, Stavka OKH. You don't need to see it all uh, to know what's going on. And what I wanted to model was, well, if, if we can responsibly design a system, then one of the areas I'm familiar with is how large organizations work. And there are, there are pyramids within an organization. So most war games um, model players here, either the supreme ruler or a famous general or the soldiers doing the fighting, um, similar with, with many large organizations. And I wanted to make a game here. The upper, upper uh, echelons, the upper executives who had all the plans coming in from their underlings and then recommended to the dictator. Um, and is very much in this almost powerless state. Um, these kind of people did exist in World War II, um, and Adolf Hausinger and Gregory Kulik were, were amongst them. Uh, these guys were part of the uh, German and Soviet high command, respectively. What was interesting to me about them was uh, Adolf Hausinger, whose side lost the war, went on to become chairman, chairman of the uh, NATO committee. Gregory Kulik, whose side won the uh, war, was executed after the war. So all of a sudden you've got this mental model, which is very common to business, of the aims and the desires of the people within it are different from the organization themselves. So you've got this wheel within a wheel going on. 
So the game is really simple, and I promise I won't bore you with my stuff too long, but I just want to demonstrate my thinking is you get to uh, pick a plan, you implement it, and then uh, there's a, the depending on how successful it is, you will get uh, glory. So the more successful it is, the more glory you get. Glory is simply a representation of how much your side likes you. Um, on this case, by the way, you notice you don't get a choice which side you start on. Um, because in real life, you don't get to pick which side you start on. So in this uh, side, I've started on the German side. Um, so you get glory, and you know, at the bottom, you see what's going to happen to you after the war. Um, so in victory, uh, you were put in charge of the post-war guerrilla movement in Belarusia. In defeat, you were hanged as a war criminal. And as you make these different choices, your fate changes. And at some point, you're going to decide whether or not you'll, you want your side to win the war, and you're going to start acting that way. This, this dynamic actually happened an awful lot in World War II. Um, the, on the Soviet side in 1941, there were a lot of Soviet generals who started to kind of hedge their bets, uh, particularly in terms of orders of executing German prisoners. And we're like, well, it's, you know, there, there may be uh, some repercussions here if we lose. On the German side, it's very well known that increasingly they uh, turned a blind eye to a lot of things. So after the war, they could say, I didn't know about that. Um, I also uh, took into account that notion of information actually matters. Um, so on, on the far side, there is a, do you fully support the party? And what that is, is whether or not you're turning a blind eye to the genocides that happened on both sides. And the generals uh, on the Eastern Front in World War II certainly did that an awful lot. Uh, uh, they either chose to uh, fully embrace it um, or were, oh, well, I didn't see any of that. Well, it was genocides, executions, I, I didn't see any of that. I was just following orders. And you get to decide that, particularly as you get close to the end of the war, that decision becomes more and more important. Uh, of course, if you choose to see it, then I display where all these genocides are happening on the map, uh, on the far, well, that side. Uh, you will see that uh, near the Volga, there's the uh, evacuation of the Volga Germans, uh, 300,000 people, nearly half of who died. Uh, just south of Krakow, you see uh, Auschwitz, which grows every, uh, every month. Uh, up here, you see the siege of Leningrad, uh, where a few million people died of starvation. Down at the bottom, you'll see the Crimean Tatars who were evacuated. Um, most of those died. Um, each, all, all of the information adds up. And what I hope to do is, as people are playing it, is they'll be able to have this mental model of, okay, that's another way of looking at how that war worked. Um, and my hope is that that's a responsible way of, of proceeding. Um, so if you're going to make uh, games that are responsible and you're looking for a way of how on earth can I, can I do that, I think one other question you should ask yourself is like, what kind of game would you make for God? Uh, now, many of you will have different religious beliefs. Uh, so your audience, uh, your target audience is going to change. But clearly, the kind of game for a God who knows the future, probably not going to be poker. Um, probably you're not going to bluff this guy. By the way, don't play poker with God or the devil. If country music has taught me anything, <laughs> don't do it. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting question of how are you going to make a game for an ethical being who you want to impress um, that will do no harm, but who also knows everything? I don't have an answer for it. I just think it may be a useful tool. So, next problem. Many of you will say, thank goodness for that. Um, the problems get a little bit harder, so I'm afraid to say. Um, so, back to 1911. Uh, the question was, can machines play games as well as humans? Um, and the, the big question at the time was this. Uh, in the 19th century, there'd been the Mechanical Turk, which, for those of you who don't know, was this fake machine that could seemingly play chess. And it was the rage of Europe. And the crowned heads of Europe always wanted, all wanted to see the, uh, the mechanical Turk, and chess players went, and they were amazed. A machine can play chess. There's, there's, something, there's something phenomenal going on. Can machines truly be intelligent? It was discovered, of course, to be a complete fake. Uh, there's a person in, inside who's actually moving things around. But the question that we could have asked in 1911 is, can, is there a way to make a machine that truly can play chess? Even if it's a machine that takes up acres. Is, is there some way we could do that? Um, of course, 
now here it's set in uh, 2011. But anyway, you know, I, I still can't get over the fact that it's 2011. 21st century, I wanted flying cars, trips to the moon. Instead, I get to download cat pictures off the internet. That's great. <laughs> Another disappointment. <laughs> um, but the question, the, the but this the, the question of can machines play as well as humans? Yes, I mean in in the case of chess, it's a solved problem. Computers can play chess better than human beings. Period. That's that's pretty amazing uh, when you look at the history of AI and what it means to be human, and what that what that means in terms of our intelligence is that was a hard hard problem a hundred years ago. The people have said, you're crazy. Um, I would bet that you know, the, the chess program that's on my phone, most of, it would beat most of it. It beats me. Um, and as you look at more and more games, then actually computers can play games better than humans at almost all of them. I mean, certainly the big genres, first-person shooters, bots will destroy you. People who make um, uh, first-person shooters have to tone bots down. It's not like you, you tone them up. Um, when it comes to uh, MMORPGs, you know, what's the biggest problem? Bots. No, uh, look, you know, we got to got to put code in to stop to stop this. Um, in fact, it's 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 very hard to find games that machines can't play as well as humans. And yet, Emily is going to say interactive fiction, and I have an answer. Uh, the question going forward is: Can humans play games as well as machines? And I'm not so sure. So. Let me back up again, because as you can tell, I tend to think in a completely random and incoherent manner. Um, the, when you look back at a century, and I think we're just beginning to get perspective on the 19th and then 20th centuries, the, there's, there's some zeitgeist, something that happened that was just, um, that wasn't noticed at the time, but afterwards you look back, you're like, that was it, that was the thing. In the 19th century, I think that it was the, uh, the, the challenge to organize religion and the challenge to their beliefs about how the earth had been formed, uh, the challenge of evolution. And it was only in retrospect, we look back, like, yeah, that was a big deal. Look at, look at all the intellectual, um, uh, the, the intellectual offshoots that that created and look how that's rolled down to us today. In the 20th century, the, uh, the, in my opinion, the vast glacial movement that happened that we barely noticed, but, I, but we're starting to feel it now, was there was all one-way traffic in that humans are less and less and less and less important in the scope of the universe. Um, there was no evidence going the other way. It was all, yeah, you used to think you were the center and you were, you were, create, you were uh, created for a specific purpose. Well, uh, actually, you know, there's a whole bunch of other creatures. Well, at least we got, you know, the Earth, that's the center of, no, not really. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's another, well, but we haven't found any planets anywhere else, so, you know, maybe our solar system is unique that way. No, there's some planets. Well, they're none like us. Well, there's kind of one there, that I believe, University of Santa Cruz, uh, that was uh, one of the things they discovered. And, yeah, what about the scale? It's, well, it's pretty big, and we're pretty small, and we really don't matter. Um, and I think that that big wave has seeped into our, our culture worldwide, and we're just beginning to digest it. And if there's a, a wave of the 21st century, um, then I suspect it's going to be about the science of the mind. Um, uh, last year at E3, in a uh, spectacularly inappropriate setting uh, of an E3 press conference, I decided to talk about free will, um, <laughs> because... <laughs> Because for two reasons, one is I thought it would be funny, uh, and, and two, um, I actually wanted to know the answer to a question. And so, for those of you who missed it, I um, completely butchered Will's game design and spoke about The Sims, uh, their free will, how much we know they've got. And with The Sims 3, I've got a pretty good knowledge of how much free will The Sims 3 Sims have got. Uh, it's a fair amount, actually. It's random based, but it's a fair amount. It's weighted options uh, versus. The, uh, the research coming out of human free will. And I picked a classic study by Benjamin Libet and said, hey, look, you know, if you weigh these up, 
the Sims have kind of got more free will than us. As, oh, hilarity ensues, I, I hope. There wasn't much laughing in the audience, actually. There was stone silence. Uh, but some of you were kind enough afterwards to say, you know, that was, that was really interesting. What I'd hoped by saying it in such a public place would be, um, I would have lots of nerds in neuroscience and philosophy writing to me saying, you're way off, you know, you, you, you're an idiot. Let me show you the paper. Uh, let me show you the research that can tell you that human free will uh, is actually demonstrable. And here are the tests. And you, it's, you know, you're an idiot. That's okay. You're a game developer. Uh, I didn't get that. Um, actually, what I got uh, from people who were within the field is, yeah, you don't know the half of it. Um, so for those of you who like me, like to believe in free will. And by the way, when you look at the uh, present studies of uh, free will, there's a whole array of, um, of theories about how we don't have any. That's, that's the growth area, that's the growth field, um, which is, hey, you know, X may, makes Y happen and our brains work the same. Um, the hopeful ones, um, uh, some of them are called compatibilists. What compatibilism is, it's this kind of intellectual gruel of uh, free will, which is, well, you don't really have free will, but it's okay because you'll always think you do. Uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't help me. In fact, you've just ruined the surprise. That, that, <laughs> it doesn't help me at all. Um, so, so if you believe that, um, uh, that we have free will, or we should have free will, and that we're not all just going to go, shh, <laughs> we won't tell each other, it's okay. Um, then the evidence is really not going well for our team. Um, if you're quite happy to say, you know what, I'm pretty much a machine, and I just go on rails anyway, you're, you're cool, that's totally fine, you know, uh, please help me live my life that way, because I don't know how to do it. Um, and so I think free will and the science as it emerges is going to become so seeped in our culture that it's going to hit us in the same way that those revolutions of the 19th and 20th centuries did is it's going to change our worldview um, and I want games to help prove that that is wrong um, I would like to have solved this problem of, because games are all about choices maybe just as we were at the forefront of the artificial decision making debate when it came to chess programs and so forth maybe games can have a role in proving free will one way or another. Um, so is it possible to make games that are only playable by players with free will? I'll let you guys think about that. <laughs> I have got some gotchas, by the way, because I'm sure there's some solutions going to come up. Uh, is it possible to make games which are only playable by players without free will? I think that's just as useful. And is this a false problem? So while you're noodling that over, let me point out some flaws in some of your reasoning. Uh, first of all, the fairness question. So, I don't go into a foot race with a cheetah. Okay, it's not a, it's not it's not fair, and that doesn't prove that the cheetah is a better person than me. It proves the cheetah's faster than me. Um, I don't play chess with a dog um, because it's kind of unfair. When you look at the way we test machines, so the Turing test is the most famous one. For those of you who don't know, the Turing test is you put uh, a human being on the other end of a terminal, a text terminal, and a machine on the other end of a text terminal, and then one human being over here types in questions, and then if the human can determine which one's a machine and which one's a human, then, uh, then the Turing test has failed. If it can't, it's like, hey, they're the same. I think that's, I think that's a human being. Then, okay, the machine is, is sentient and, uh, uh, and is intelligent. I would, I would suggest to you that when we look at our games, which are, can we make games that are only playable by free will, we need fairness. And part of that fairness is language fairness. Uh, part of the reason that the Turing test doesn't sit well with me is it uses language. And let's invert it for a moment. What about an inverse Turing test? There's a machine out there that's intelligent and says, you know, I'm going to have this test, I'm going to communicate with a computer and with a human, and if another machine, another computer can't tell the difference, then okay, humans are intelligent. Um, this would be the easiest test in the world. You'd give us a math problem. You know, like, hey, add up these 40 integers. Oh, you didn't do that within four seconds. No, you're, you are not intelligent, you're not a human. Um, because mathematics is the language of computers. 
And so it wouldn't be a language fair um, problem. And I think that any games that we devise have to be language fair. Um, so that removes things like, well, I'll just have interactive fiction. You have to uh, type it in. Sorry, that's not language fair. It should be choices that a reasonable person would say, yeah, it, you know, th that, that's not a particular specialization of either species. Um, so I'd like one of you in the room to be able to do that, please. Uh, just, you know, minor philosophy. You will say, but you will start to get to the point of, well, what defines free will? You know, does this mean a uh, baby, age three, has got free will because they now have to devise a game that is uh, uh, playable by a baby and a human, but not a machine? Uh, you will also run into things like, well, what kind of free will? Um, and I can answer that last one. I want the full Monty. I want the whole free will. I want the, I get to choose everything about my life and choose my own destiny kind. Thank you very much. Um, so if you're asking that, that's, that's what I'd like. So that's another problem that I have for you. But there's, a, there's an easier way in. And, and one of the ways that, um, that I think may help is, what if we uh, come up with a way of making games that can only be played if you're aware of them. So what was that? You were all playing a game without knowing it. And let me tell you the rules. The rules were whoever was sitting on the far side of there who didn't have someone sitting to their left was going to win the game. And if I got all the way to the end, then I'd reset all the way back to the front. You were all playing a game. You weren't aware of it. Um, that feels kind of weird, huh? Now, if I was to rerun the game, a lot of you would just sit here and say, okay, yeah, 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 rerun the game and get the point. Some of you might say, 20 bucks? Yeah, I'll embarrass myself for 20 bucks. I will go and sit there. The, the act of being aware of a game makes a difference. Here's another example. We're playing another game. No, we're not. I was just kidding. Like, oh, oh. Again, that's kind of weird. You get yourself into this mental space of, I'm, I'm playing a game, I'm part of it, I need to know what the rules are. So, is that a way into this problem of, can we make games that can only be played by agents with free will? So can we make a game that can only be played by players who are aware of it? Um, it seems trivial. It seems obvious. And you can't ask them because of the language fairness issue. Like, well, that's not really fair because then, you've, then you're detecting language. Here's another thing I could have done. Um, I could have asked somebody beforehand, hey, you know, my, uh, uh, my talk, it's not going very well, and I would like to uh, have, have it look a bit fuller. When you come in, could you, uh, could you sit on the, uh, on, on, on the left? Like, if there's somebody who's on this side and they're a little bit to the left, could you sit there and make the audience look a bit bigger? I'm a friend of my gosh, sure, I'll do that for you. You're nervous and you're a freak and you ask me odd things to do. Um, but I've just made them better at playing the game, but they don't know that they're playing a game. And that is the way most chess programs work. Right? All chess programs work. They don't know they're playing chess. How could they possibly know they're playing chess? They're just bringing in moves that are being calculated. So, can we make a game that can only be played by players who are unaware of it? Again, a subject that I would like, I would encourage you all uh, to look at if you, if you, if you so care to do. Um, part of the reason that I'm sort of circling around this area is. I think that one of the things I'd like for us to do is to be able to eventually make games that can only be played by machines. Because we have limits. Um, I'll get to this on the next problem. Our limits are the amount of game rules that we hold in our head. Um, and so, back in 2011, ooh, nine minutes left, I timed it right. Uh, back, in twin, back in 1911, the question would be, can we make new kinds of games? And boy, did we make new kinds of games. We really, really did. It was great. Um, from 2011 forwards, and Michael touched on it earlier, the question is, can we make, can games make themselves? Is there a way for us to somehow engineer a game that can create itself, either ahead of time or on the fly? So here's um, some just types of games uh, that we can imagine. And uh, thank you, Robin Haneke. We worked on this years ago now. Um, I haven't updated it because I've found no, I've made no progress whatsoever on this. But anyway, it might be helpful. <laughs> is uh, here's some kinds of games. Where one type is rules are created in advance by a game designer, uh, and there are few enough that the player can hold them in their head. Uh, type two, they're created by a game designer and held in a book or umpired during play uh, with limited rules. That's kind of the Kriegspiel model of hey, it's a bunch of rules. 
Next one is rules are created by a game designer in advance, and it's played. Extra rules are created or changed by an umpire or player. That's D and D. Um, it's a very, very good and powerful model that we haven't really explored yet um, when it comes to modern games. And type four is let's play a game and we make it up. So, for example, let's play a game. Uh, whoever uh, tweets Ian Bogos the most during this lecture wins five bucks. Because I know that Ian's been tweeting extremely cynical uh, tweets uh, throughout this lecture. I just invented that game on the spot. Can a computer ever do that? Is there any way that I could walk up to a terminal and be like, you know, Rod, I know you. You like war games. That's your secret guilty pleasure. Um, I'm going to make you a game. Is there any way that that game would respond on the fly? Um, of, hey, in this war game, I want to actually do something unusual. I want to go through the Ardennes. Uh, you know, crazier things have happened. Um, and the computer says, okay, I understand. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to help shape that experience for you. The note of caution I would have there is that if we can do that, and I think that this is, this is something that is going to happen. I, I think there's a lot of smart people working at UC Santa Cruz and around the world on this problem. I think it is going to happen. My issue then is, if we recognize that games are art, and computers are making these rules, and it's fun, and it's enjoyable, then we've got a real computer-created art form that is extremely powerful, and that concerns me. But as you've noticed, I'm concerned about a lot of things. Um, and with that, that's it. Um, thank you very much for all your time. <laughs>